Hello everyone, how are you? Today I will going to talk about tutorial system. Okay, let's start. Do you know how the sounds that the horses make when they are galloping is made? I actually did research on that and I found out that the horses wear some shoe-like structures which is called horseshoe and here you can see a horse and a carer for the horse actually fixing a horseshoe by some screws to the legs of the horse which will actually protect the lower parts of the horse because lower part of the horse's leg because if if actually when it rides a rough surface like uh, a road uh, its lower leg will be erased uh, in a short time so that's why they're putting these things in the lower part of the leg to protect the leg of the horse okay so this is the horseshoe so you see the shape this shape is called a horseshoe shape and uh, this actually brings us to the first slide second slide okay so this is a clinical situation where the kidneys of our body can look like a horseshoe and this is called horseshoe kidneys where the lower poles of the kidneys are actually bound together and this occurs because as you know that the kidneys actually as this uh, forms the pelvis and then they ascend and during ascent sometimes they get trapped in the inferior mesenteric artery which can cause this problem of uh, pull, uh, of uh, horseshoe kidneys next slide okay so this is another this, this slide is, is also talking about another congenital problem of the kidneys okay, so can you identify the congenital problem of the kidney here Okay, so let's look where is the kidney first let's find out so this is a CT scan of the abdomen of a patient in the coronal view and the kidney in the left side is here and the kidney in the right side is oh my god there is no kidney in the right side so there is agenesis or aplasia of the right kidney in this patient this will actually bring a lot track load of work to the left kidney which will actually can fail in the long run okay next slide what's here oh my god this looks like an alien baby you see the small ears which are very low the flat face some abnormal limbs with uh, fingers together or bended limbs so this is very crazy is it a human or something yes it's a human being it's a human child and the problem that uh, occurred in this child was actually agenesis of both of his kidneys and this actually lead to some problems um, that like that I've already mentioned and also caused pulmonary hyperplasia and which has actually uh, caused him to die inside mothers uh, caused him to die okay so it was not compatible with life so this is called Potter sequence this is called Potter sequence next slide so you see here two kidneys are shown and both kidneys have some ur two ureters okay so one ureter in this kidney and one is this kidney but uh, the problem you see that there are multiple structures multiple small globular structures in both kidneys and those are actually seeds so this is actually a specimen of polycystic kidney disease so polycystic kidney disease can come in two flavors uh, autosomal recessive flavor which I can uh, and also an autosomal dominant flavor the autosomal recessive flavor actually occurs in a child and this also can be associated with hepatic fibrosis leading to CLD and in case of autosomal dominant flavor the patients are actually adult and they can also have very aneurysm in their circle of willis okay so remember those points are very important to know next slide here is a slide depicting the common causes of renal failure in a patient so the renal failure can occur due to a reduction of blood flow so this is the blood vessel the blood flow can be reduced there can be damage to the kidney by substances coming through the blood and there can be obstruction of the renal tract uh, from pelvis to any part suppose urethra or bladder or urethra so this this is obstruction so renal failure can occur in three basic mechanisms pre-renal mechanism renal mechanism or interrenal mechanism 
and post renal mechanisms so let's take a talk about them in a brief moment okay so this is a, a cartoonist picture to show the prenal acute renal failure and also called uh, prenal azotemia same thing okay so this can occur if the blood supply of the kidneys actually uh, decreased uh, which can happen in case of low blood pressure okay so anything that causes a low blood pressure will actually cause a reduction in renal blood flow and it will cause renal failure pre renal acute renal failure okay so let's go to the next slide uh, in this slide you can see someone is injecting some agent in the kidney this is actually not a real thing this is actually a cartoon to show you that if you inject some drug into the patient's blood which is uh, nephrotoxic it will actually damage the kidneys especially the nephrons and in the nephrons tubules are the most susceptible part of the uh, nephron and it will cause actually damage to the nephron uh, damage to the tubule so uh, ultimately leading to acute tubular necrosis so the common substances that can cause a big acute tubular necrosis are antibiotics like aminoglycosides and also uh, agents that we use in radiology such as contrast agent that can also cause renal damage and sometimes heavy metals like lead can also cause damage to the nephrons and cause acute tubular necrosis so always remember that acute tubular necrosis is the most common cause of renal or intrarenal acute renal failure okay so this is the most common cause or uh, simply most common cause of acute renal failure and acute tubular necrosis can also occur if the blood supply of the kidney is cut off okay so here let me explain uh, or clear something so in case of pre-renal azotemia or pre-renal uh, causes if the blood supply get cuts off first what happens is the renal um, function is actually decreased but when the circulation is cut off at a critical level it can also cause ischemia of the renal tubules leading to tubular necrosis so tubular necrosis doesn't only happen with uh, some toxic agents like aminoglycosides or uh, contrast agents but it can also occur in case of critical ischemia to the kidney so prenal cause can also cause uh, acute tubular necrosis remember that so post renal cause so post renal causes are obstruction any obstruction in the post renal part so in the urethra or bladder or urethra will cause an increase in the pressure or filter, uh, increase the pressure in the kidney ultimately and this will lead to a decrease in decrease in production of urine by the kidneys because you, uh, the, the kidneys have to produce against a high pressure and this actually reduces the amount of urine produced per, per unit time so there is actually renal failure okay this can occur by any pathologies uh, you can remember from your book so maybe uh, suppose uh, in the ureter you can have ureteric stricture in the bladder you can have a bladder arterial obstruction due to a stone or cancer in the prostate you can have prostatic hyperplasia or cancer in the urethra you can have urethral stricture so those are the some to mention okay so here i have a quiz for you and to answer that quiz you have to sh tell me which one is the normal kidney and which one is the abnormal kidney and what abnormality you are seeing so push the pause button for a second and think very good so the normal kidney is this the left one so this is a nice normal kidney and this is a abnormal kidney showing some necrosis inside so this is a t kidney with acute tubular necrosis very good let's go to the next slide so this is also a specimen of kidneys which are actually uh, having some white structures so this is a white structure white white so this is a specimen of renal papillary necrosis so to understand that you have to go back to the anatomy so i have brought a structure for you so this is the standard structure of kidney where the cortex lies in the outside and these triangular structures are the medulla okay so those medullas are arranged in a pyramid like structure or triangular structure and they are also called papilla so whenever there is damage to the papilla there it's called papillary necrosis so as you can see some papillas those are the papillas the, the darker ones are the papillas so the lighter ones are the cortex the darker ones are the papillas 
and there are some decreases of the this capilla and this capilla and this capilla and other scapula. So renal capillary necrosis is an also important cause of renal failure and this occurs mainly due to chronic abuse of analgesics like aspirin or can be also happening into in diabetes mellitus. Okay, so the most common causes. Next, let's next slide. So we have a baby now. And this baby, if you can look closely, has a big face, edematous face, a big abdomen, maybe ascites, and two legs which are seems to be swollen. Okay, so this patient has generalized edema. So when this patient came to the doctor's office, the doctors ordered some tests. Okay, and one of them was urine test, and the urine contained a lot of proteins. Okay, and they also ordered blood test, which is serum albumin and the serum aluminum was very low and the cholesterol levels were was high so can you tell me the diagnosis pause for a moment very good the diagnosis is nephrotic syndrome okay. so next the next question is if i ask you if i do the biopsy from this patient's kidney and see the biopsy slide under the electron microscope what i will find your answer should be effacement of the podocyte food processes. Why? First of all, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in a child is minimal change disease. And effacement of the food processes is associated with minimal change disease. Okay, so let's see the picture of effacement of food processes. Okay, here you can see an electron micrograph. So it can actually first seem very tough to you because you are most probably not acquainted with these type of pictures. Okay, so this picture shows that it's a cut section of kidney first of all and cut section of nephron. Which part of the nephron is the glomerulus and it's actually part of a capillary of the glomerulus and this capillary has a large RBC in it. Part of it is shown here and this is the endothelial cell, endothelial membrane and this is the basement membrane outside the basement membrane are the podocyte food processes okay so to compare normal subject there is this patient slide also and there is some difference you see this this basement membrane is thicker because this image is zoomed out and this image is zoomed in and that's why that that's the difference okay so those are the podocyte food processes uh, here uh, they are like tall buildings but in case of and patient with minimal change disease they will be flattened it so the long processes are not flattened so this is actually called porocyte food process effacement okay so to get a better idea I have put some more images okay so this is actually an image showing you a better picture of glomerular capillary and its relationship with porocyte food process so the main job of porocyte uh, main job of glomerular capillary is to filter and to filter effectively it takes the help of podocytes and podocytes are fan cell you see the name podocyte so poro means poro means okay legs or foot and side means cells so cells with foot are called podocytes so to me they are very funny cells they look like octopus and they do like octopus they actually uh, invest around the capillary okay through some processes in their foot so those are called porosite food processes. So they invest the whole glomerular capillary membrane by forming some legs or foods and then forming some food processes like this. And those food processes together actually forms a filter and this filter in, in, in between two food processes there is the filter and the proteins come through this filter. Okay, so actually they control the protein filtration or filtration of any substances in the glomerular capillary. So if they are damaged, there will be extra loss of substances. And in case of uh, different type of nephrotic syndrome, especially in case of uh, minimal change disease, the damage of food process occur and this causes a uh, loss of protein from your blood. So whenever there is loss of protein, especially albumin, there will be a decrease in collateral osmotic pressure. And this decrease in collateral osmotic pressure will actually cause the fluid in your blood vessel to shift to the tissue and causing edema that we have seen in the previous patient okay very good okay in case 
in case of nephrotic syndrome there are some other causes and let's look about them so here is one picture of, of another patient who, who is actually not a child who was adult but had the same features of uh, generalized edema and then a high protein in the urine and also hypoalbuminemia and some high cholesterol in the blood but the biopsy from this patient uh, differed from that patient so in case of this patient this is the electromicrograph of a biopsy specimen from kidney and this electromicrograph shows this is the inside of a blood vessel or inside of a glomerular capillary and here you see the endothelial cell nucleus and cell bodies and this is the endothelial cell actually so forming the capillary and below endothelial cell are those are the basal membranes and in case of basal membranes you have you can see some yellow arrows and those yellow arrows are depicting some blacky structures so those blacky structures are actually proliferation of the uh, glomerular membrane due to deposition of some immune complexes in the basement membrane and those are actually called uh, a, a, in a spatial way and the, the way they are called uh, is called spike and dome so uh, this this uh, this is not very easy to understand actually so this is the dome and in between domes so this is one dome this is one dome in between dome they call the intervening structure a spike so spike and the dome appearance okay so this is this occurs due to immune complex deposition in the glomerular membrane most commonly idiopathically so there is no specific reason in most of the cases but in some cases uh, it has been said that infection with hepatitis C virus or infection with uh, hepatitis B virus and in some cases use of NSAIDs and penicillamine can cause uh, this damage and so uh, this is called membranous nephropathy and it is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in case of adult so always remember that most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in a child is minimal chest disease most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in an adult is membranous nephropathy very good so there is another disease or another cause of nephrotic syndrome in case of an adult patient and uh, which is called membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis but before going to membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis let's take a ride now by a tram so first we started with horse now we are going to a tram so when you are uh, traveling with the tram you can see the tram line okay so nice tram lines okay now now let's let's talk about a patient who presented with the same symptoms that two previous patients a child and an adult presented but the electron micrography of this patient showed that okay so what can you see here actually this is the basement membrane and you can see that there are actually two layers of the basement membrane that looks like a tram a tram line okay so this is the tram line or tram track appearance of the basement membrane which can be found in another type of nephrotic syndrome called membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis so this is a less common cause of a nephrotic syndrome in case of an adult patient but uh, it's good to know that about it okay next slide okay so what do we have here someone is peeing and their pee is red that's bad sign okay so that shows that their pee contains rbc okay let's go to the next slide and in the same patient whose pee contained rbc was actually seen by a physician about two weeks ago and the physician noted that this patient's pharynx was very congested red and he diagnosed the patient as a case of pharyngitis so the history is actually two weeks back this patient had a pharyngitis and now he is peeing blood through his urine okay so he is having a hematuria or you can say a coca-cola color urine with his previous background history of pharyngitis so the diagnosis should be pause for a moment very good nephritic syndrome or acute glomerulonephritis so better to say nephritic syndrome okay so uh, can we can we discuss about how nephritic syndrome occur 
I think we can. The most common cause of nephritic syndrome is uh, post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So in this disease, the, uh, the history is like that. The patient gets infection of the pharynx or infection of the skin with some group A beta hemolytic streptococcus which leads to formation of some antibody antigen complexes and those antigen antibody complexes actually uh, gets deposited in the renal um, cells especially renal glomerulus and there actually uh, causes activation of the complement because you know that in case of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction the complement will be activated when it is exposed to a antigen antibody complex so the complements are activated and the complements release c5a which is a chemotactic factor for neutrophil neutrophil comes in and it damages the glomerular membrane and when you damage the glomerular membrane the rbc's will leak out so the rbc's are leaking out of the glomerulus and now you can find them in the urine so you can find them in the pee the patient that was peeing is peeing rbc because there was leakage of rbc's through the glomerular membrane understood very good so remember that uh, agn or acute glomerular nephritis after streptococcal infection is a type 3 hypersensitivity but rheumatic fever is a type 2 hypersensitivity and both of them are caused by same organism but their strains are different the organism that causes rheumatic fever is called rheumatogenic strain and the organisms on the organism strains of same beta hemolytic streptococcus that causes AGN are called nephr nephritogenic strain okay the strains are different but the organism is same okay the basic pattern of organism is same but the strains are different okay remember that now uh, as you have discussed first the nephrotic syndrome and then the nephritic syndrome we can discuss about just common differences between them okay so in case of nephrotic syndrome what we have the main thing is high protein lost in urine so proteinuria which is excessive and severe and this causes hypoalbuminemia generalized edema and also some hypercholesterolemia but in case of nephritic syndrome the most common presentation is hematuria there can be some proteinuria but this is not severe and the, another thing is that this patient can develop hypertension which is which is not commonly present in case of nephritic syndrome so also remember that okay so those are the basic differences between nephrotic syndrome and the nephritic syndrome okay so there are some other forms of nephritic syndrome other than acute post streptococcal glomerular nephritis and which can be uh, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis also called crescentic glomerular nephritis so this is one bad form of nephritic syndrome which progresses very rapidly and actually can kill the patient within weeks or months and some other uncommon causes of nephritic syndrome are IgA nephropathy and Alport syndrome it's, it's good only to know their name okay so let's move on to the next slide what do we have here we have here a patient's pee and this pee looks yellow and a bit turbid okay let's move on to the next slide the same patient it's the kidney of the patient and it's also look yellowish so let me explain that actually this patient presented with a yellow pee and he, she also had some other symptoms she actually peed some yellow pee and also had pain in the flanks and high fever okay so yellow pee pain in the flanks and high fever and some uh, problems during urination she had some burning sensations which is also called dysuria during uh, urination and uh, frequency of urination so those all along with some uh, damaged kidney which looks yellow are all other features of very good pyelonephritis so this woman had pyelonephritis so pyelonephritis is an infection of the kidney which actually occurs due to ascent of the organisms from the patient's bladder to the ureter and ultimately to the pelvis and the kidney so basically ureteric reflex 
has a very good role in pyelonephritis, acute pyelonephritis. And acute pyelonephritis is actually a sequelae of UTI or urinary tract infection. And this occurs more commonly in women because women are more likely to get urinary tract infection because they have a short urethra, the vagina is close by, the colon is close by, the vagina contains a lot of organisms. Okay, so those are the, the principal causes. That's why uh, the women get more infection uh, than the males do. Okay, and remember the common organisms that can cause uh, the urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis, and most commonly they are E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Staphylococcus. Those are the common organisms that can cause UTI or pyelonephritis. Okay. So very good remember that let's move on to next slide okay what is see he's she what you can see here oh, some nice balls with some spikes over it okay so let me explain what happened here actually those spiky balls were removed from the from a patient's bladder and this patient had complaints of hematuria for about few days uh, seven days or eight days and he also had some pain and he passed some painful he passed some urine which is very painful and ultimately uh, an operation was done and those structures were removed and those spiky structures are actually can you tell those spiky structures are very good oxalate stone and uh, on query the patient told the doctor that uh, in this summer he had worked very hard but he didn't took a lot of water so he was dehydrated okay so this dehydration actually caused precipitation of his urine especially precipitation of the calcium uh, with oxalate so those calcium and oxalate actually bound together and form some crystalline structure and this actually formed the stone okay this is the basic pathogenesis of the oxalate stone formation so now let's go back to yeah we can see some animals here and actually this animal is called staghorn okay you see this animal has very nice horns which are actually branched horns okay that looks like a tree so tree like horns very nice so why actually i put it here what's the relationship between this staghorn with rail system actually you can see a picture in the next slide okay so this is actually a x-ray from a patient which shows in the two sides in the in this side and this side some same kind of structure same kind of um, brown structures in in here inside the kidney okay so those are actually stones which actually lost in the pelvis and the calyces so this is the renal pelvis and those are the major calyces and the branchings are minor calyces so a stone form which actually involved all of the pelvis all of the major and minor calyces and those look like staghorn and and the doctors removed the stone and it looked like that the branching pattern and it's called a staghorn calculus it the staghorn calculus actually forms from sodium ammonium phosphate okay so the ammonium phosphate is the main sorry uh, ammonium magnesium phosphate so ammonium magnesium phosphate is the main chemical substance that causes the formation of a staghorn health calculus so it is the second most common calculus and um, you have to remove the calculus because it can grow up into a huge size and it can cause renal failure okay so those two are the most common stones calcium oxalate stone and the ammonium magnesium phosphate stone also called a struvite stone but there are some other common stones which are uric acid stone and cysteine stone uh, one thing that you can remember is that the struvite stones are more likely to occur in case of an alkaline environment can you remember that ammonium is an alkaline substance so it will form in an alkaline environment so ammonium magnesium phosphate stones will form in an alkaline environment and it can actually enhance the alkaline environment can be created by some bacteria like proteus mirabilis okay so which which will produce alkaline urine and favor the formation of staghorn calculus okay 
So there are some other ca calculus like uric acid calculus or uric acid stone and cysteine calculus, but they are very rare. Let's move on to the next slide. Oh my God, here we have a patient. Actually, this patient is a four-year-old boy which came to the doctor with complaints of gradual swelling of the abdomen. And the doctor examined the baby and found a mass in the baby's, uh, which, which actually involves the baby's right hypochondriac, right lumbar, and right, uh, right inguinal region. So a huge mass, okay? So the baby actually has undergone many investigations and ultimately was operated. And the operation revealed that the baby had a big tumor in his right kidney okay so uh, this this big tumor what it is can you tell very good it is the Wilkes tumor so it's a very common tumor in the childhood okay which which actually occurs due to germline mutation of the Wilkes tumor gene and the tumor actually contains uh, immature kidney mesenchymal tissue which is actually prim primitive glomeruli and primitive tubule and stromal cells. Okay, so this is, uh, I think, the most important things that you should know about Wilms tumor. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is this is a biopsy specimen. Actually, I should tell some background history for you. Actually, this patient came with the doctor with the complaints of uh, bleeding per urine, so hematuria. And this patient was a smoker for long term his age was about uh, 65 years and he didn't have uh, that much of a problem except for a recently developed hypertension and also the patient had some weight loss in recent times okay and then the doctors investigated him and ultimately reached a diagnosis of renal pathology okay and then the renal pathology i'm not telling you and then the biopsy, did, biopsy, biopsy uh, then they operated the kidney and then resected it to show us. So the patient actually had very good renal carcinoma or renal cell cancer. So renal cell carcinoma is a very common cancer. And I've already mentioned that smoking is a very important risk factor for renal cell carcinoma. And there are multiple types of the renal cell carcinoma. The most common type is clear cell type. Remember that. Okay. So renal cell carcinoma, as you can see here, this kidney, in this kidney, there is here, here is the cancer. So it is actually in the upper pole. So this is the normal parts of the kidney and there is abnormal mass and this is the cancer, which actually commonly occurs in the upper pole. Okay, so let's remember that. Let's move on to the next case. So this patient actually also smoker. This patient also presented with uh, passes of bloody urine or hematuria, which was painless. And this patient didn't have any other symptom. And this patient had undergone to the clinic and he undergone through some tests. And after testing, it was revealed that he has some pathology in the bladder and he was operated. And the pathology sh showed that, that his bladder contains some masses. So this is the bladder mass and also this is the bladder mass. So this is a case of transitional cell carcinoma very good so always remember that the most important risk factor for transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder is smoking like that of renal cell carcinoma very important i think that's all from me today i have tried to cover the most important conceptual and clinical cases that you must know for the rest of your life so the most basic things i think you must uh, refer to the text for a better discussion I just covered the main concepts. Thank you for watching my video. Bye bye.